Wendy Jensen. I would like to welcome Chink Aslan to WSTL TV for our next segment in looking back at World War II. Chink, um, you said that you tried to enlist. Yep. And what year was that? Well, that was in uh, uh, 42. There was about six of us fellows that uh, were working. We quit our jobs and uh, tried to enlist in the Coast Guards because we figured that would be the safest place to be, you know. <laughs> you were right. And uh, well, they turned us all down. Most of them, they said they, they don't want you because you got varicose veins. And I had high blood pressure. Well, I get excited, I always have high blood pressure. But they turned us all down. And so we got, what are we going to do now? Well, so then we all says, let's try to get in the Navy. So we went to the recruiting office, and they turned us all down the same way. So we couldn't get in the Navy either. <laughs> and then we didn't have no job, and we thought, well, what are we going to do now? So we went down the cabin body, and uh, we all got a job down there, and oh, we got some awful work. We says, well, we just have to work here until we get uh, drafted. I can't remember how long we worked there, about two or three months, and then we all got our notice. <laughs> so we all went to service, and out of the six guys, three of the guys went in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they went in the Navy, Maybe. and the rest of us guys went in the Army. You wanna, want me to keep on going on this? Oh, yes. All right. Because well, my well, then we uh, all got drafted, and that, of course, uh, us fellows that went in the Army, we went down to Fort Sheridan. And we got down there, and we got in the barracks and all that stuff, and then they, well, they didn't want us laying around, so they all assigned us to different jobs. So they sent me over to the uh, day room over there, and it was a two-story building, and they wanted me to go out and wash the windows upstairs. So I got the ladder and all the stuff and started washing windows and that. And of course, I go up there and down the ladder and move it over to the next window. Well, in the meantime, somebody must have, one of the officers or somebody come along and read out a bunch of names. Well, they all took off. My name was on the list. Of course, I must have been on the bottom of the ladder at that time. <laughs> so, so I got up the ladder there and I thought, see, I looked inside, there was nobody around in there. And I thought, what's going on here? Nobody told me to quit or anything, so I kept washing windows. <laughs> then the time to quit, I took and put the ladder away and put the equipment away and walked up back to the barracks. And I went in there and here the barracks was empty. Rows of bed down through there. And in the middle there was my duffel bag on the bed and not a soul around. I thought, what happened? Pretty soon the guy says, say, where were you? And I says, I was right where you'd put me, over washing windows, over on the day room over there. Well, he says, your name was called. You were supposed to have been shipped out an hour ago. I says, now what do I do? Well, he says, you're going to have to wait till the next shipment comes in. So he says, you might as well go eat and then enjoy yourself until they come. So I went down to eat supper, and then afterwards I went down to PX, where they have, like, beer and stuff like that down there. I didn't know anybody, and all of a sudden somebody, hey, chink, and I turned around, and there George Berry was. And I said, well, how come you didn't get shipped out? He said, I didn't have a pants to fit me. And he says, how come you didn't get shipped out? I says, I was up and or down the ladder on the outside of the day room when he called my name off, and I didn't hear it. So we had a visit for, I think, a couple of days or something like that. And then uh, this next group came out, and then we got shipped out to uh, Camp McCain, Mississippi. And I was assigned uh, into the infantry, 87th uh, Infantry. And it was a, a new uh, division that uh, was uh, inactive since World War II. And they were a, a, supply, a supply division that supply, you know, got supplies to the veterans overseas at that time. And all these guys were uh, mostly from, uh, well, they were from all over, 
all over the country from down there, but uh, there was very few of us from up in Midwest Wisconsin and up through that way. Most of them were from out east and, and down south. And But then when we got, uh, got down there, after we got shipped down there, and all it was was uh, a wooden uh, barracks with black tar paper on the outside. They weren't even done. They didn't even have the the uh, chow line set up or, you know, the where you ate and all that stuff. That wasn't even set up yet. And I thought, well, you're getting a service down at Fort Sheridan. We had excellent meals down there. But we got down there. In the old days, they says, well, what you get this black coffee, white bread, and beans. And guess oh, what yeah. the first guess what the first <laughs> meal was when I got down there? What? <laughs> That's what I got. And it had a, they fixed it outside on the uh, gas ranges and that outside. They didn't even have the the well the mess hall and that fixed up yet, hooked up and that. So then we were all assigned to help them uh, fix up all this stuff and that. So we were just like uh, carpenters, handyman and stuff like that, till we got to set up. And I was one of the first guys, or our group was one of the first groups that was in there, besides the, the older people that was going to run it, that the head guys and that. Right. And that was, oof, that was something that was. And let's see, well, then we, uh, we would start basic training like everybody else did at that time. We had calisthenics. You get up in the morning, roll call, lined up. And they have a check, see if everybody's there. And then you'd go eat chow, and then you'd come back, and then you'd, you'd uh, either go to school and start learning stuff, or they'd uh, march you around and stuff like that. And then, of course, then we went through basic training like that, and then they shipped out a bunch of, bunch of the guys to a different outfit. And then, of course, we went to advanced uh, military training. We. Uh, we had maneuvers, oh, all that stuff like that, and oh, maneuvers. I got about three stories on that when we started on that. Uh, we had, uh, uh, well, one time there we was out bivouacking. We were outside and it looked like rain and that, so they told everybody to uh, pitch tents. Well, when you pitch tents, they were pup tents, and there was two halves. You carried a half and your partner carried a half. Well, at that time, I got to be a sergeant, so I was the head of the, the section. I had two guns under me, 81 mortars. And while well, I got everybody paired up with tents and that, and I looked around, there was nobody left. And here I was alone with only half of a tent. <laughs> and it was getting dark. And I thought, now where am I going to go? So I looked around, and I looked up there, and there was a chicken coop up there. So it was starting to rain. So I went, I didn't tell anybody either where I should have told them where, where I was going. Well, I went up there and I got in that chicken coop and gee, I cleaned out a spot there and I laid down and gee, it was nice and it rained, it was dry in there and everything. See, I woke up in the morning, the sun was shining and I thought, where am I? And I got up and I looked around and I looked out where the tents net, not a soul around. Everybody was gone. Now that's the second time. <laughs> Everybody, you again. Yeah, everybody was gone. <laughs> and I didn't know, we come in there in the dark and that, I didn't know which way to go or nothing. So I got my gear all together and I went out and I hit the road and I didn't know which way to go on the road, right or left. And then I started walking down, I thought, well, I might as well go one way. If I'm going one way, I'll, I'll run into something. Pretty soon here come a Jeep and I hailed it down. Here it was the mail carrier. And I said, what happened to everybody? Oh, he says they pulled out in the middle of the night because they were down in the hollow and that water was running everybody's tent and that was getting flooded out. And there was up in the chicken coop <laughs> nice and dry. <laughs> and I says, well, I got to get back to my company, Company H. Oh, how penny, he says, I'll take you there. So they said, where were you? I told him where they were. Well, didn't you tell anybody? I says, no, I didn't tell anybody. I said, everybody was starting to rain. I said, everybody else was in a hurry to get set up. And I says, I was looking for a place to sleep. <laughs> So that's one time, and then, uh, let's see, I got a note here, what's the next one? Oh, yeah, that chicken coop, now the fire. We was out uh, on uh, maneuvers, and then we were uh, just like simulating a war, you know, 
and we were shooting these mortars and that, and it was about 100 degrees down there at this time. And uh, we shot these mortars out through there, and it was all timber dry and everything, and we started to fire down there. And so then they called off everything, and everybody had to try to fight, uh, fight the fire. Well, 90 degrees, and then have a fire to fight, no water, all this guys, all we have is a canteen with a quart of water, it's supposed to last us all day long. Well, them guys were drinking water like that and run out of water, and they were sweating, was pouring them, trying to fight that fire. And the guys were dropping down, we were trying to get medics there to take care of them. And uh, finally a water truck come there, ice cold water in there. Well, then the guys start just gulping that down, and then they passed out from drinking that ice cold water. Oh. oh. And then, uh, well, we finally got that fire out down, and, and uh, well, then we started it up the war games again. Well, then the next time, this was uh, another maneuver thing that happened. We, uh, uh, like I, I'm a, a sergeant of the these guns, the 81 mortars, and we're down behind a hill with a gun in that. They dig a big hole or they place it down in there and stuff like that. And then uh, I got to go up on top of the hill, and then when I go up there, I pace it off to the top of the hill so I know how far I'm from the gun up to there. Then I have to estimate from, from the top of the hill where the target is. So then I call by, down and, and tell them how many yards it is. Or, and then the, on the back of the shell, it's like a, like a small bomb, what it is. It's got fins on the back. And in between each fins, they got just like paper like this. And that fits in between each one of them fins, and they're what they are, they're powder. So if you want the shell to go further, you leave all them fins in. But if you want it shorter, you take take out a couple of them. And uh, then we have a, well, there's a, I got a picture of, uh, of the mortar here someplace. If I can find it. I haven't looked at this stuff for so darn long yet. That's a beautiful diary. Oh, it isn't in this one. Well, anyhow, it's a tripod. And then you got a big, like a tube, like a chimney stovepipe or something like that. And then you got a, a base plate where that sits in the tube, and then the tr tripod fits onto the barrel of it. Well, then you got a crank here. You lift it up or lift it down. And then we put stakes out in here. And then you line up like that to each stake for sight sighting. Well, you call back there, and then you, you well, I, I can't remember what I used to tell them, but I'd say, uh, uh, 500 yards, 700 yards, or something like that. Well, then they'll take and set it up, and then I fire one for a search. So they fire one round, and then I see where, where it goes. We try to go beyond the target, and then we, we work back. And all they do is I call back, and then they crank it up a little bit, and then they'll, you get on a target. Well, then when you, you, uh, get on a target, then if you want to like a search or traverse target, if there's enemy in that inner, and then you take a shoot around and then you crank it over, and then you shoot another round, crank it over, shoot another round, then you crank it up, and then so the shells go further back and then you go, and it's like that, so it cover that whole area. And that's how that, uh, the, the mortars worked. But uh, we were shown a demonstration and we was in a war game, and uh, we were doing that stuff, and I was up on a observation post up on top of the hill there, and I was looking out through there, and uh, all of a sudden, one of these guys come up there and he put some mercurcomb in that on me. He's, you're a casualty. You just got hit. <laughs> so then they got called the medics up there, and he bandaged me all up, and then they took me back and put me on a truck and took me back to headquarters where everybody was. 
He says, well, what are you going to do now? Yeah, well, you just sit there until we're done with this maneuvers or whatever it is. And uh, well, I said, where are you going to sleep? Find any place you want. Well, there's big two and a half ton trucks and that all over the place. And I thought, I'm not going to take and lay down here when the big trucks come and run me over because they're driving with what they call blackout lights. It's just like a parking lot and it's just a little slip like that and just a little light out front. Well, you can't hardly see anything in front of you. So I seen a couple big trees over there and I thought, oh, I'll go over and lay next to a trunk of a tree. Then I got over there and I went to sleep. And all of a sudden I woke up and something was kind of pushing on the side here and it kept on coming and I hollered and I screamed and pretty soon the truck, it was a big truck broke loose and it came down and it hit me right on the side back here, rolled me right up against the tree. By that time the bumper hit the tree so there I was pinned in her. Oh, and I couldn't no. move or nothing, I was screaming and nobody knew what was going on. And finally a guy came on and said, what's the matter? I said, dude, get this big truck off my, I said, it's crushing me up against a tree here. <laughs> and uh, so then they finally got the truck out and I was, didn't break no ribs or anything, but was the driver a big bruise there. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> well, that was maneuver, sir. That's, uh, that's, let's see, what else you want me to tell you? Okay, let's see. Um, did you go from Mississippi to Europe then? Or did no, no, you have another no, no, stop? No, no, no. Then they, they uh, took all these fellows and they uh, took, well, I made corporal down there. And uh, they took all the privates and PFCs and shipped them out. So there was only about 80 of us fellows left in the company. And we were uh, non com officers and that. Uh, and uh, we were doing KP and everything else because there's nobody else to do that. And then all of a sudden we got a new bunch of fellows in. <laughs> and then we, uh, we had to go through uh, training with them again, so advanced uh, maneuvers and basic training and that stuff. So I had to go through all that stuff with them again. And then we finally got shipped uh, to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Well, then the same thing happened out there. They sh we trained all these guys, and I thought we're going to be nothing but just uh, trainers, you know, train all these people. Well, then they took all these guys that was uh, Air Corps in the Air Corps, and the guys that was in the officer's training school, and they sh all shipped all them people in our, our outfit. So then we had to take and go through that again. So just about three times that I had to go through basic training and maneuvers and all that stuff. But these kids, they were young kids, 17, well, most of them around 18 to uh, 19 years old. I was an old man at 21. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then we uh, went through uh, training there with all these, uh, these guys. And of course, I got to be good buddies with them again. But I had three different buddies. I started out with these were all new guys. And then, uh, but to now to jump back though, you know, I went down there all by myself and George Berry, of course, he was with me and he went, went to a different uh, company than I did. Oh. So okay. there I was with all strange guys and that, well, they were all the same too, the people that came in, so we were all in the same boat. But uh, it didn't take long to get acquainted and uh, find out the kind of friends that you wanted to hang around with, somebody that you could trust your life with, you know. Some of these guys, you give them orders, you know, they didn't want to take them. And uh, well, when I, after that second uh, batch of guys we went through, then I got to be a, a staff sergeant, where I got in charge of these uh, two mortars. And uh, after we got through with all that, we went up to uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. And from there, we got uh, shipped overseas. And uh, we got on uh, on a big ferry, and we thought, what ship are we gonna get? And uh, we got on uh, Queen Elizabeth. Really? But they uh, took and ripped everything out of it in um, big state rooms and stuff like that. They had all these folding bunks all the way up through on this ship. And we got in there, and they got the whole division on her, plus other people. That was a big ship. And uh, well, some of the guys, they just 
stepped, got on the ship there, and they started getting seasick. Uh -huh. We wasn't even moving yet. <laughs> oh, and, dear. Well, when we got on the ship there, we got uh, my, uh, my uh, well, our company and that, we got assigned to the uh, kitchen down the galley there on there. Well, the guys were getting sick and everything else. And I uh, thought when I got there, I, these bunks were one right on top of the other, you know. Mm -hmm. And I thought, uh oh, you'd be on the bottom bunk and the guy up above gets seasick or something. And I thought, no, I'll take a bottom top bunk. <laughs> Was and, good. and and you know everybody was so many people got seasick and uh, well when chow come there wasn't uh, hardly anybody there you get on a table like this and then they have little uh, well it's plates and that slide so they don't slide off the table you sit there and you start eating and you look up there and hear this slide down through it. pretty soon you hit another wave and it'll slide back again <laughs> <laughs> did you get seasick Pardon? Did you get seasick? No, I didn't get you seasick. Didn't. No, not a bit. I ate good. <laughs> but what really bothered us, though, when they had these, uh, well, the Queen Elizabeth was really a deluxe ship. And they had great big wide stairways where you walked up and down, down like we had to go downstairs to the kitchen. And these waves, we took the northern route because that was a, shab, a fast ship. and. Uh, most of the other ships here in convoys and that and then they but this was a fast ship so we took the northern route and we were all by ourselves and uh, they were zigzagging course up there so if there's any subs or anything trying to you know torpedo us or something like that they uh, they never well we didn't have no trouble but one time we were down there they had uh, they had uh, machine guns and that up on deck and they, nobody said nothing to us about it. And all of a sudden, they start shooting and it shook the whole ship, you know. Oh, all those guys started running up on deck, you know. We just thought we were getting attacked or something. And they, never mind, never mind. It's uh, it's uh, just a practice. We fire them every once in a while. And let's see, what else is there? But how long did your trip take you? Five days. Only five, five days? No, five days over and six days back you know, <laughs> on a ship. You know. oh. and we, uh, I was going to say something else, too. Oh, yeah, and that big wide step, sir, I was telling you about that. We were going up, up the step, and then all of a sudden you hit a wave, and then you're going up step, but it felt like you're going down step because you were going down this way, and the steps went up. Oh. <laughs> and then when you came down, the ship go up like this. It, you know, you had really, it was really strange. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, well, we got over to, uh, we lived in uh, Scotland over there, and then we went down to, uh, in England, and uh, it was uh, around the uh, 1st of November or something like that. And uh, we uh, stayed in uh, private homes. Well, you know, they, people were out of it, but we got the homes and that. And uh, we lined up right out the street, and it was so foggy over there that all the time we were there, I think we were there three weeks before we got shipped over to France, I seen the sidewalk dry once. Otherwise, it was foggy and damp. And good place for arthritis, if you had it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we... Uh, we, uh, one thing strange over there, though, was they had a bathroom upstairs, and they had running water in that, and they had a fireplace down in the kitchen, and then the water come in through there, and there was a coil like that through the fireplace, and then you had to build a fire in there. If you want to take a bath and want warm water, you had to build a fire in there to heat up them coils so you'd have hot water up in the bathroom. While we was in this town, you try to find burning material to, so we were going all over the neighborhood looking for something to burn so we could get the water warm. So the two or three of us fellows, we were kind of had to take a, a bath up there. So we all worked together and we got the fire going good and that and got the water warm and got up there and somebody else was in there using our hot water. <laughs> <laughs> so then we had to put a guy up there and then, so we, we had a chance to take a shower, or not a shower, but a bath up there. Well, 
then let's see, what was it? Then we all uh, we all got shipped out from there, and uh, we crossed the crossed the where's, where was it? Uh, in between uh, England and uh, France. The English Channel. Yeah, the English Channel. Okay. Now that's what we crossed that, and uh, we went. Well, here's a map. Where, where our division our division went England over here I'm steady up here so I don't, I'm not shaking so much we, we landed here in La Havre France and then we took trucks and that all the way over here to where's Metz now Metz France now here we went way over to here that's where we started our our service because that's how far they were. And then from there we went down to uh, the Saar Basin. There was a fort there, and uh, Germans were still holed up in that fort. And uh, well, we relieved another uh, outfit, and uh, we were supposed to try to get them Germans out of there. So we shelled them and stuff like that, and then they finally gave up. Well, then from there, we went down to Saar Basin. And, uh, gee, we was, we was uh, really starting to go pretty good down there. We was advancing and everything else, and then all of a sudden they called us back because the Germans took all the men from down in there, and they went up here to the where the Battle of the Bulge was. So that's why we were making advancements down here. And so then we turned around, and uh, these arrows here show you just the way we went. And we went way over here to Reims, Reims, France, and then we went way up here to Bastogne and up and through there, St. Vint. And uh, that, that was terrible. We was not only had the enemies from, while well, we had the weather, the coldest it's ever been over there in a decade, I guess, and snow and cold and we didn't have the equipment that we should have had that we had just leather boots we didn't have no goloshes no like they got now they got what they called the they had the mickey mouse boots the big insulated ones there we didn't get any of them and so many people froze their feet and lost toes and everything else i what i did i had two pair of socks and i pinned one inside of my coat in here until the other one got uh, wet, and then I'd take and change them and pin that up there. We didn't wash them or nothing, we just put them up there, so <laughs> we wasn't bothered by mosquitoes or anything like that up there. But, but uh, we got up there to uh, Battle of the Vulture, and uh, that, that is, I don't know, I don't even like to talk about it because that was terrible. That's parts of people's hands and legs and that laying around all over there. And uh, and uh, machinery and all the tanks and trucks and everything along the road there were just burnt up and and uh, oh yeah. Well then after we got well I can't remember how long we were up there, but after we got away from that, we uh, started to move again pretty good. Then we went to the. Oh, let's see, the Rhine River? No, no, it's a different river before that. The Main, the Main River. Well, before that, we had uh, Siegfried Line. That's, that's right in here. You see all them, like, pillboxes? They had just like a big, uh, long fence, but they had great big square cement pillboxes. In front of them, they had uh, what they called tiger teeth. They were out of cement. See if I can find a picture of it in here someplace. But we couldn't get up beyond that stuff because uh, they were put in the ground this way and the tanks couldn't get up over the top of her or nothing. And then they had mines all over there and that. Well, then we finally went up there and uh, we had to try to take some of them. Finally, we did get some of them there. And uh, I was up on top of a great big hill there and uh, they told me to zero in on uh, them pillboxes over there. So I 
pulled back the orders there and they fired one round there until I went a little too far, so I pulled back a little and then they got pretty close to it and I said, that's good, leave her right there. And then these Germans, I could see these Germans walking up through it. They're marching right up through. And then five, four or five guys would drop out and then four or five guys would come out of the pill blocks and uh, get in there and then they'd march to the next one. Well, they didn't, I couldn't get ordered. They wouldn't give me orders to shoot, you know, or anything like that at them. So then after they went through there, they says, fire at will. So I had my choice when I should fire. So these pill blocks, when they built them, they didn't have any restroom or anything in them. So the guys had to go outside. <laughs> so I was, okay. I was sitting up there and I watched and here come this one guy outside. And he went over there and he pulled his pants down. He bent over. I, hey, you guys, fire one round. <laughs> and that round hit there. And the last thing I seen him, his pants still down, he flew forward there, crawling in towards the pill box. And I called them guys back there, and they got a good laugh out of that. <laughs> but uh, after that, uh, let's see, where do we go then? We went. Uh, yeah, we we finally went over to the main there river. We went across there, and then we were on the way to the Rhine River. That was another thing, the Rhine River. We had we had guys over there that uh, we was on a well, we was in Boat Park, right on the Rhine River, and we took over a big uh, hotel there. And we had these uh, uh, these uh, fellows there going around inside there and uh, went through all the rooms there and took all the pillows out of the rooms and we threw them in one pillow. And we had pillows about that high on the floor. Oh, I said they were nice to sleep on. <laughs> And then uh, down in the, this big motel, or hotel, down in the basement they had a, a liquor or a wine cellar. And of course they took and spent it all up and put bricks up there. And this one fellow, he went down there and he found it, and so he started digging it and got it open so he could crawl in there. And it was just about like a big room like this here. And it was wine all over the place. And then there was dirt floor and there was bottles down in there. And so he come up there, where'd you get that? Oh, I'm not telling, why not? He says, well, then you guys will go down and get it all. We finally, somebody somebody says, well, let's follow him. Followed him, we went down there, and sure enough, we found it. And we had, uh, I had a trailer that we, uh, of a Jeep and a trailer, and we filled that up with wine bottles and that. That was just before we went across the Rhine River. And we filled that up, <coughs> put the tarp over the top of it, and we went across the pontoon bridge. They built a pontoon bridge across there. And uh, the bottles were falling out of it. But when we got on the other side of the Rhine River, then it was uh, pretty fast going. But, gee, we, I don't know, we couldn't even keep up with the Germans. They were retreating so fast then. But then they, they made another stand there. And uh, uh, let's see, where was that? Well, we finally, well, we went as far as, uh, as the Czechoslovakia border, but in between there, we had a uh, lot of places that we had to fight again to keep the Germans going. But uh, I, got, I got sick in one of these places, and uh, I just couldn't stand it. And uh, so I finally I went to the uh, dispensary and I walked in there and I walked up to that. What's the matter with you, soldier? And I, that's the last thing I remember. Next thing I remember, I was laying on a cot or a stretcher. And uh, he says, hey, fellas, says, you got uh, yellow jaundice. We're shipping you back, back to uh, Nancy France to the hospital. So then I got an airplane ride from there back to Nancy France and in the hospital. At that time, they, they, uh, they've, uh, liberated a lot of prisoners out of all these prison camps. And I was put in a ward with all these uh, prisoners, the, the guys that were prisoners. And they were just like skeletons with skin stretched over them. And, 
And I looked at them and, oh, I just, you just couldn't imagine to see something like that. Well, I got in there and uh, they says, all you do is uh, take and rest, try to eat, and that fishbowl odor full of uh, lemon drops, he says, eat all you can of them. And so I laid there and I, I felt terrible because I was looking at them guys and I, uh, other than that, I, I didn't feel that bad, but I ate all that stuff. And uh, when I was in the hospital there, Germans gave up. And the nurses and everything, they were all celebrating that. And, and these guys, uh, I don't, can't remember what country they were from, but uh, a couple beds down from me, there was one guy, and all he'd do is have his feet curled up, and he's sitting in the middle of his desk, and all he'd do is wrap his turban, put a turban on. Pretty soon he'd take it off again, and then he'd fumble with it, and he'd put the turban back on. I don't know what was the matter with him, but, but that's a lot of strange things that... Well, then I went back, uh, finally got, the, they were going to ship me back. And, uh, of course, all the railroads, all the bridges and that were blowing off. So I had a heck of a job getting back again. So they shipped me. We had to go way up through Holland, and then we came back down again. We, oh, I don't know how many days it took us to get back to, to uh, my outfit. But then we got back there, and, uh, of course, we had the, uh, guard duty and all that stuff. Other than that, we were just waiting for orders to what they were going to do with us. And uh, in the meantime, the uh, company took over, a, well, not division, took over a, a brewery over there. <laughs> so each company got a, a barrel of beer a day over there. Wow. Well, then a lot of people were going to towns and stuff like that. And uh, my buddies and I, we sat around, we played pinochle, drank beer, and <laughs> had a good time. And then all of a sudden, then we got orders that we're going to get shipped out. We're going back to the States. We thought, how come we're going to go back to the States? And all the rest of them are still staying here because we were the, one of the last divisions over there. And then we got shipped out of there. We went down to uh, uh, Camp Lucky Strike. That's where assembly area on. And then we, uh, we got put on a ship. And we, uh, I think it was US West Point that we came back on. It took us six days to get back. And uh, well, then we got back, and then they all got a furlough to go home. So we all got a furlough, and we went home for 14 days. And then when I was home on furlough, Japanese gave up. And we were going to supposed to, we were going home because we were supposed to go back to camp and get all set to go over to the South Pacific. Oh my gosh! And uh, we was up on, we was home on furlough, and the Jap was, it was just like a big weight off of me when I found that out. I'm sure, you'd seen enough in Germany where you didn't want to go to the Philippines. No, I didn't want to go to. I was glad that I went over there instead of over there with all these people with all that jungle rot and all that stuff over there. But there's so many stories that I probably left off, you know, didn't go into details on that. Here, um. here's, a, here's a book from my, our company. Now, this is a book that you got during World War II. You, now, you, this is uh, before we went into, uh, I got this book before we went into, uh, into service, I mean, into uh, oh. combat. Oh, okay. Yeah, here's our company here. Oh, no, I can't even remember where I am. Oh, there I am. There I am right there. I don't know if you can see that through there or not, but that was one company. That was each company. And you look, you look at them there, they all look the same. Yeah. Of course, you're a little skinny and some guy's fat. But uh, now I got to tell you about uh, afterwards. Our company, well, we disbanded. Wait, I'm not done yet. I disbanded our, our uh, division. And they, they were supposed to, we did, at that time we had uh, points. You had to have so many points before you could get discharged. And uh, 
I didn't have enough points, and most of the fellows in there didn't have enough points. So they were supposed to send you to the closest separation center to your home. Well, I figured I'd go to Camp McCoy or Fort Sheridan or someplace like that. And you know where he sent me? They sent me out to uh, Fort Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> That's close. <laughs> or no, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. That's right, <laughs> Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And they put me in the MPs. And then I got to be Sergeant of the Guard, where I'd work uh, 24 hours, and then I'd have three days off. Well, officer of the day, he was ahead of me. I had to report to him. So he told, he told me, he says, well, I'm going to bed. He says, if something important comes up, he says, you let me know. And I thought, well, he can do it. I can do it, too. So I had the corporal of the guard. I says, corporal of the guard, I'm going to bed. If anything happens that you need me, I says, wake me up. <laughs> and that's the way it went down the line. So I got my eight hours sleep, and then I've had three days off after that. And I was just about thinking of staying in. But uh, I, after this, I, uh, I was signed, I was in charge of a, a barracks, too. And then I, uh, charge of, uh, I was sergeant of the guards. Well, on them three days, one guy says, don't hang around camp. He says, get out of there. If you hang around camp, they'll put you to work. They'll make you do something. So every time we, we were off, we all took off on furlough or something, or I mean, went to town or something. But I was in charge of this one barracks, and I, uh, we'd get new guys in there every every day, and uh, well, they'd have to go up to the day room, which was just about a block away, and they get their bunks and that stuff, their bedding, their their mattresses and all that stuff, and their their uh, blankets and all that stuff, and they had to carry them all the way down here, take about three trips, and I thought that's foolish. I says, uh, then when you get through, I had to get fellows that was in the barracks to carry them all back again. And then they no, no sooner get them back up there, and then we get another bunch in, they'd had to go up there and carry them all back down again. And I had a, a non-com room or a, for a sergeant or something that was empty. Nobody was using it. And I thought, well, I'll get the guys to stack them up nice in there and put the, mattresses all in there. Gee, it looked nice. It cleaned it all out and everything. But I was on guard duty, and a captain, he had an inspection. So he come in there, and he looked in that room, and he says, who's in charge of this barrack? I said, Sergeant Osland. Where is he? He's on guard duty. Well, when he comes back, he says, you tell him I want to I wanna see him. So I come back to eat, and he says, oh, you're supposed to go up and see the captain. I went up there, and he says, you in charge of that barracks? I said, yes, sir. He says, uh, did you hear my orders about carrying all them mattresses and beds and everything uh, up there? I said, yes, sir, I did. I said, sir, I says, no sooner get up there than the other men. Uh, he says, no, wait a minute. He says, I gave you an order to, to take them up there. He says, uh, weren't you overseas? Didn't you take orders? Yes, sir. I said I took orders, but I says I never had a lieutenant or nothing over me when I was overseas because every time we got a lieutenant or something over there, he got killed. And I says I was assigned to a company, and when they wanted firepower or something like that, they'd call back to me, and so I'd lob some uh, mortar shells in up there. Well, he says you're up there now, and you're supposed to follow orders. He says, you know, I could have you court-martialed. I said, maybe you can, sir, but I says, I thought this was awful foolish. These guys, they've been through all this war and that stuff, and they really haven't got enough points to get discharged and that, and they come back here. Never mind, he says, you do it. You get some, I'm on guard duty, sir, I said. I said, I can't uh, take off a of guard duty and do that. Well, assign somebody. Well, most of the guys want to get uh, three days off. Nobody just get it. Well, I finally got enough guys to carry them all up there. But we were so mad. That, and then one of our orders was too, is a jeep or a truck or anything, when they park, they're supposed to open up their hood. So the officer come along, you can inspect and see if the motor's clean and everything. 
so I told all these other fellows about that, and they all got kind of mad at him too, you know, because of this. And, uh, and here his Jeep come up there, and they pulled up, they stopped, and then opened up the hood. So he told this one guy, he said, you're on duty. I says, why don't you go up and write a ticket on his on her for not opening the hood? And uh, he had to sign your name on the bottom of the ticket. So what happened was uh, he called called that fellow in. He says, you know, that was my Jeep. He says, you could have opened up the hood. He says, that is my order, sir. He says, my order says, when, when a vehicle is parked there and the hood isn't up, write a ticket out there. That vehicle was parked there. The hood was not, so I read a ticket. And boy, and then they had inspection again, and he went to that guy's duffel bag and dumped it all out and everything. And uh, then he left it. He was looking for something in there that uh, wasn't supposed to be in there, you know, to get back at him. Uh -huh. And so we tell, tell him, go up there and tell him that there's something that's missing out of your duffel bag because he didn't have nobody there with him. He was just there by himself. Well, then I couldn't get out of the service fast enough when you have people like that to uh, tell you to do one thing and not uh, carrying that, like carrying all them mattresses and that up there and back and forth. But then I couldn't get out fast enough. But when I was there on guard duty there, we had prisoners and we had a fence all the way around the prison and we had the barracks in there. And uh, I had to have a head count every night around 10 o'clock or something like that. Well, we had uh, a fellow that was inside there with a, one of these uh, dogs, canine dogs and that, and they're a vicious boy. And uh, he says, now when you go in and check, you holler and let me know. So I went there and I was going to go and check, and I hollered in there and hollered, and he never answered. And I figured, well, he must must know I'm coming, got the dog back on a leash or something. So I went to first barracks and I went inside there and I counted everybody and okay, and I went to second barracks and got in there and I got to about halfway to the third barracks. Here come that dog after me. <laughs> and I run up and got to the door and I went and shut the door. Just when I shut the door, the dog hit the, hit the door and there was colored people in there, you know. <laughs> What's the matter, white boy? You always get caught by the dog. And I hollered at that guy. I says, well, how come you didn't keep that dog back there? He's the one, won't you let me know? I said, I hollered in there and I hollered at you. You never answered or anything. And I says, I checked two barracks. Well, he says, don't you ever come back in here again. He says, you're lucky you got in there. So then he put a leash on the dog and he got him out of there and I got back out of here. <laughs> I was scared to go in there after that. And then one time, another time that they got us out of bed, out there was uh, uh, that Indian Town Gap, there's a highway that comes right through it. And uh, right on the corner there's uh, all kinds of poles and that with uh, big transformers and that stuff on there. And these young kids come sailing down through there, they hit them transformers, put all the lights out in camp, smashed their car up, I don't know if any of them got killed. I think two of them got killed. And we had to get wreckers and everything out of there. Oh, I had to get the officer the day up. Well, the corporal got me up, and I got to, we got them all up, and we got going. And that was almost bad as the war over there. And then another thing, when we, we was there, maybe I'm talking more about this than I was about service overseas, but another thing is that uh, they had so many strange dogs running wild around out there in that camp. So one of our orders was to round up all these loose dogs. Well, we was kind of green, you know, at first, and they caught the dogs there, and we got them back in there, and then we, what are you supposed to do with them? Oh, well, you got to take them up to the veterinarian. So the veterinarian uh, put a shot in them, you know. I said, now what do we do with them? Well, I suppose you got to take them up to the dump. And this one guy said, well, well, what do you do with them up there? Just throw them in on the fire. Well, we didn't catch many dogs after that when they told us we had to do that. So they were still running around. But the general, every time he'd call up, you know, he says, there's a dog running out in my yard. 
so you have to send somebody up there, you know, and they'd chase the dog, but they wouldn't catch him, get him out of the general's yard. <laughs> chase him out. Yeah. But that's quite an experience. I, uh, I sure wouldn't want to go, go through it again. It was. You were telling me earlier about you only lost one man under you, and it was because. Under in my two sections, yeah. But I, I lost men uh, getting sick and not going back, but oh. I mean by casualties. Casualties. Yeah. I only lost one. And what did he do wrong that he, you said he didn't, he didn't follow, follow your orders. advice? <laughs> he didn't follow orders. Orders. After, no, after I think about it, that captain, that that's, goes to show you that. Uh, no matter how stupid it is, do it. Because uh, that's where you learn to take orders, you know. And I think a lot of these kids nowadays, uh, it would do them good to go into service to learn what they can do. Now this, this if, I, if he would uh, mind what I told him to do, keep your head down and don't move, he would have been alive today, probably. Where was that? Where, was that in Germany or France? Or? It was in France, yeah. It was in France. Oh, yeah. well, Germany, we uh, we was uh, one of I think uh, one of the luckier ones, and a lot of these other outfits was over there, like the rifle companies and that. That that just they're the ones that had to go out on night patrols and all that stuff, you know, and all these mines and stuff over there. And then all these booby traps. We come, we come down, marching down through there. There was a German laying there, arms laying down there, right in the mud, laying like that, with a, a P38 pistol laying right up on his hand. I put a guard on it so none of the guys would try to get it. And uh, you know, they'd have them booby trapped. If you picked it up, oh. they'd have an explosion. And even if you tied a string around a, around a gun or something and went over like there's uh, trees or something like that, you'd get over behind that, they'd have the explosion over there going off. So we had a, we had a guard there till all our men got by it, and then we left it just lay there and kept on going. Then when some of these your uh, houses were the same way. They lay something, let let something lay there, you know, and then somebody, oh, there's a good souvenir, and pick it up, and then, oh. big bang, yeah, blow off their fingers, or. So you, from the time you got, well, when we first hit France there, and we got up there to Metz up there. We got we got down into a railroad cut, we was a railroad, and there was uh, banks on each side. And we got down in there, and they start shelling us. And before, it was kind of an adventure for us because we wasn't really in anything yet. And pretty soon, they start shelling us. And on top of the hill there, they'd hit that, and the mud and that were slapping around on us and everything. From then on, boy, we were shaky all the time. I think that caused a lot of guys to start smoking because we got our cigarettes for nothing and K rations and C rations and that. We always got little cigarettes and that. And you're like I was sitting up on the front line there, and you know there's nothing to do. You look around and and uh, any report back and all that stuff to uh, any uh, enemy uh, movements and stuff like that. And other than that, you don't do nothing. But you're just waiting for a shell or something to come or somebody open up on with machine gun or something on you. And one time I was up there. We uh, we was sitting up there and there was a, a captain artillery captain, and then there was a radio man, and then there was three of them, and then there was me over here. Of course, we had a, a cable on a big spool, and I had one man carry that, and then we had radios, or telephones, what they were. Well, when I left that, my gun position, they'd uh, hook their uh, telephone on that wire, and then we'd unwind that wire all the way on top of the hill where I was. Well, then I could call back on that. But when the Germans and that, they start shelling, they'd cut the wire. So then I have to have that man that carried that up, trace it back and splice it again so I could call back. 
Well, then I told the captain about that, and he said, well, I think you need a radio. So then I got a radio in case I can't get back there, I can still get back with a radio. Well, then they were shelling us up there, and this uh, one radio man, he got, uh, oh, his whole side here was just busted open, busted his radio all apart and everything, and he wanted my radio. Well, I says, how am I going to call back? He says, them, them uh, little mortars won't do nothing. He says, I got art artillery, he says, that I could call in. Well, I was zeroed right in on them, their uh, tanks, and that was on the edge of the woods. Of course, that won't do anything, but there might be a get a lucky shot in there. So I gave it to him, and he couldn't get artillery in there anyhow. And so then I, I uh, finally got the gun. guy uh, found uh, where the wire was cut, and he spliced it back together again. And then I could call back there, and uh, the captain over there says, hey, throw in a couple rounds back in there, there's some activity or something going on back there in the woods. So I says, I'm, so I'll shoot about three of them back in there. So I called back and told him to shoot three of them. Then they went back in there, gee, all of a sudden flames and black smoke was coming up. I hit something back in there. Captain says, I want to send out a scout to see what, what you hit. And on the way back, I was going back, and then the uh, captain says, uh, was you on that mortar that fired that, that shells back in there? I said, yes, sir, I was. Well, he says, you know what you hit? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, you hit an ambulance. I said, what? I said, one of ours? No, he said, it wasn't ours. Oh, I felt sick even though it was an uh, ambulance, you know. He said, don't, don't worry. He says, they had something in that ambulance besides... Uh, what they were supposed to have. They were hauling ammunition or something. And I said, I seen the smoke in that. So that's the only thing that I really remember on that stuff. Do you but remember where you were at that time? Where, uh, um, where, where did this particular battle take place? Was oh, this in I France? Couldn't tell or? You, I couldn't tell you exactly where that was. I uh, lost track. But I think it was down in the Saar Basin where we were down in there. That long time ago, that's a lot, you know, hard to remember all this. Stuff. <laughs> yes, I understand. And then try to, well, I good. looked through these books here for long. That oh, I got to show you something too about this reunion I went to. Uh, after, after I got back, I got this. Uh, where is it? Oh, here it is, right here. I don't know, maybe you get the glare of this, you can see it or not. But uh, here's the four fellows that I run around with. We were in service uh, together from Fort Jackson all the way up through uh, France and Germany and everything. And this one here, it says, uh, uh, number one, two years, well, well it's, I can't read what it says, sir, to tell you the truth. Well, it was in Belgium on January 1st, 1945. The Rover Boys. There was Johnny Iano, uh, Frank Havel. Well, when I got in the service, they called me Ozzy. And, uh, and then uh, this is John, too. Both the two end guys are John, but they called him Jack and him John. And when I went to this reunion, uh, all four of them were there. We we're all still alive, and we all made it. And this little short guy, Johnny here, he uh, he was a corporal. And I was looking at the names in that town, and uh, where we uh, registered, and they had a uh, colonel. I said he was no colonel. He was uh, he was a corporal. So this one lady that was there, oh, what did you find a mistake? Well, I says uh, this Johnny here. I said he was a corporal. So she went back and checked on it, and then the next day she seen me, and she come over to me, oh, oh, she says, that's right, he is a colonel. I said, what? And then I talked to him, and he re-enlisted, and he worked himself up to a colonel. Oh. <laughs> and he was under me when he was during the war. But here's, here's the four fellows together, and we was going to line up the same as we did in this picture, but we got them just opposite. Here's Johnny here, and then Frank Havel and myself, and this is John Turner. And uh, 
Let's see now. He, he's from New York. I can't remember what city he's from. And this uh, Frank Havel, he's from Illinois. And I'm from Stoughton, of course. And he's from out in New York. And most of these fellows were from New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania and out in that area. And here's another picture of us over there. And there I was smoking a pipe. I don't smoke at all now, but and then he don't smoke at all. I don't know what kind of the paper it says there. Well, it's Capital Times that the folks must have sent over to me or something, this picture or something in it. So, oh. so I, we thought this was really something. We we're gonna get our picture taken, you know, the way we were, the four of us. But you can see how we were dressed there and that. Of course, I was really dressed up. I had a big overcoat on. You were the warmest one. <laughs> Long. That's nice and warm. That is. Oh, they're coming all apart. These things don't stick together very good. Now, let this is the Golden Acorn, 87th Division. And I can't remember what uh, that was. That was the one when I got uh, shipped to uh, to uh, Pennsylvania. That's the patch I wore. So that's the two patches that I was wearing. And these are all fellow pitchers, not fellows that I was in the service with. Okay. Oh, what else? Anything else? Anything else? I think we've gone over almost everything on my list except um, you mentioned getting a Capital Times from home. Yeah. Did, did you get much mail or packages, oh. or were, were those oh, things hard to get? I, I'll, I'll say one thing. Mail was just like a shot in the arm. Oh. People don't realize this, but when you get mail, for, don't, all you had to do is send a few words. You know, If they got somebody in the service there, gee, write to them, because it really helps. And then, of course, my cousins and that from Deerfield and that, they sent over cookies and candy and stuff like that. And my folks, they sent cookies and that stuff. Of course, a lot of them were crumbled up, but the crumbles were good too. Talking about shipping stuff over there. This uh, fellow from uh, Frank Havel from Illinois, his dad was a barber down there. And uh, he shipped them over a big round jar, no spot. Well, it seemed like it was that tall, full of cherries, red cherries, you know, candy cherries and that. Yeah. And he took and drained all the juice out of it, and he filled it with brandy. <laughs> and he put the cover on and shipped it over, and when they looked at it, we figured, well, it's just cherries. <laughs> <laughs> so when he, got, when he got it over there, he, uh, he says, I'll tell you guys, he says, I'll give you a cherry, but the brandy is mine. <laughs> So he drank the brandy and gave us, you could taste a little brandy on that cherry, but we got a good kick on that. And he was, uh, he was when we was in the service down south too, he, uh, when you go to PX, that's where you can get your beer, or, well it's like a little store or what it is. And uh, it, we'd get beer in a pitcher or something like that and come back and don't forget the uh, peanuts. He had to have beer, he had to have peanuts with it. And no matter when, whoever went down there, get some beer and some peanuts. So we start calling them Goober. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we got this name, Goober. <laughs> but I uh, played a lot of uh, Pinochle in that with the fellows there. I was, let's see, the other question I had was, um, since you were, you were artillery, is that what you, you were an artillery? 81 mortar. 81, mortars. you were mortar 81 sergeant? 81 mortars, yeah. So did you carry a, a sidearm in addition to that, or? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I carried two. I carried a carbine and a 45 on each, on a side. Yeah, so we carried a lot of that stuff. And uh, these, uh, These mortars are come in three sections. Now here's uh, here's that bridge that they uh, went across the Rhine River with, made out of all floating boats. Dude, that was carried too. Get out that 
that Rhine River, that's a swift river. Is it? Yeah, and then they had uh, boats and that uh, up along the shoreline there too. And uh, I went on there and there was a big cane pole there and I went and got some worms and I fished in the Rhine River over there. Didn't catch nothing, but I, I fished over there. Oh, well, good for you. But uh, I was looking for that mortar. It is three, uh, three pieces to that mortar. There's the base plate. Well, here's a small picture of it. There's a base plate, and then there's a, a, a tube, and then a tripod. It's, uh, it cranks up and down, or, and then it slides back and forth this way. Uh, I should have looked out. I got one there someplace, but I don't know where it is now. But uh, I can't remember how many uh, fellows I had there. We had uh, number one gunner, number two gunner, number three gunner. And them three fellows, say one carried a base plate, and one carried a tube, and the other carried a tripod. And then the next guy carried uh, the stakes in that for sighting up on. And then we had uh, uh, ammunition carriers. They had a vest with pockets in there. And they, three in the back and three in the front. And they're heavy, yeah. but uh, oh, I'd say about between 30 and 40 pounds. And then you had to carry that. And we had uh, three, uh, three or four fellows that carried ammunition, and had uh, another guy carry the uh, reel of wire for running them back and forth. And then, of course, all of us carried shovels to dig foxholes and stuff like that. That's another story, cut digging over there in France over there, trying to dig a foxhole. You get down so far and you hit slate rock, you couldn't get down any further. So you dug as steep as you could get it, and then you crouch down. Mm. And then you try to sleep in there, standing up almost, crouch down. Well, then in the morning, your legs are tired, you can't get out. You have to help somebody help you pull out a lot of times. But uh, most of them, what we dug was, uh, long ones so you, you get down that far and then you pile the dirt up around it so then have shells or something you can lay down in there and sleep but most of the time we didn't have nothing to sleep with we had one blanket we had our uh, wool uh, overcoat and that was it and then our shoes of course i took off my shoes and then i wrapped them so that my feet would dry out but our, our boots and that hardly ever got dried out and that's a lot of, uh, I was lucky, well, there's a lot of other fellows lucky, too. They took care of themselves. Some of these guys didn't take care of themselves, and they lost a lot of feet, toes and that. But this, this gun, of course, most of the time we, uh, we, we could, uh, on a road or something, we'd throw it in a Jeep, in a trailer, and haul it. But then when we couldn't get up there, no roads were, couldn't get, they wanted to take a town or something like that, they'd, uh, They'd uh, have to throw the stuff on the back, and off cross country would go. One time there, we had done that. We had to take this certain town. Well, well, we didn't know this at the time, but the Germans already left that town, and uh, so they unpacked all our gear and we started walking cross country, and we didn't run into no Germans or nothing like that, and. Boy, towards the end of the day, we finally got up to the town there, and here all them tar trucks and everything were, was there. They had kitchens and everything else set up. And here the Germans were gone, and they drove right up the road and went right up there and set up and while we were coming across the field. <laughs> we, who was we ever <laughs> mad about that? But over there, you know, you, you had K rations and that. You never, you never got full on it. You was hungry all the time. Well, when we got kitchens set up like that, and then we'd go over to this company and look and see what they got for to eat. So we'd eat over here or we'd go over there and get in that line. Well, then they'd run out of food because too many guys get over there and want to get in their line. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, like uh, breakfast cereal and stuff like that, they'd mix powdered milk. Milk, and then they'd put vanilla in it. And then they'd put sugar in it. So all you had to do when you cereal, you just pour that milk and that stuff over it. And 
I would recommend it. I didn't I, care much for it. I, I was wondering how it tasted. Anything. <laughs> so you were probably cold and hungry most of the time you were over there. Over there, well, during the summer and the spring there, it was pretty nice, but uh, that winter there, oh, that was that was terrible. Yeah. Can you think of anything else you want to talk about? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I've been jumping, been jumping back and forth here. That. Uh, well, that's how our minds work. Yeah. But I thought this this year is the best thing I ever bought was when I bought this because it's got everything in there and it got pictures of all the fellows that I used to be with, and this map it, it got the dates and everything on there where when you got there. Here, May 8, 1945, V Day, and uh, uh, 12th of May, 1945, contacted Soviet the forces over there. And when we got up there, well, gee, we uh, Czechoslovakia border, you know, they're noted for their musical instruments and that over there. And of course, I was back in the hospital at this time. And these guys were in there, and they were buying accordions and all that stuff, and boxing them up and shipping them home. The time I got up there, well, then we were just about ready to ship out and come back again. So I never got in on any of that stuff. But everything, you know, everybody was looking for souvenirs and that. But when you're walking and that, you can't carry all that stuff, so you always look for something small. Right. Of course, I got uh, one place there we we took over underneath the bed there was a box there and I pulled it out here it was all pipes smoking pipes them curved ones like that with a little cap and that on top there gee I thought that's something small that I could carry with me and I got a big long one like that but I broke this was porcelain on the bottom and I broke that you put water in it and then the smoke goes through the water and then I got a a, a knife a little knife like that that had a corkscrew and that on there. Most of that stuff that then people made, made their self over there. But other than that, uh, I don't know. Let's see, what was that? So probably for you, the worst part was the Battle of the Bulge. Well, yeah, that, and then down in the uh, uh, Sar Basin, or that was bad too. But the Battle of the Bulge, that was. Did you did you arrive there after when it was over? Pardon? Did you arrive at the the Battle of the Bulge when it was over? Or no, 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 it was still was, going on. It was, was still going on. going on, yeah. But but the the stuff that uh, we was we was more of a in a reserve. Well, our other two divisions or, or uh, regiments, they had done most of the fighting that we was in reserve. And, uh, but the stuff that uh, you seen over there, that were, were the, the German tanks, you know, they were really desperate because they wanted to get to this here fuel station here because their tanks and everything were running out of, uh, out of fuel and they couldn't get anything here because uh, they were bombing their supply lines and that stuff. Well, when they couldn't get to that uh, fuel, well, then their tanks were useless. So then they could just shell them or knock them out so they can't use them anymore. But uh, they, they would, uh, you know, the casualties and that, they'd run right over them with the tank and everything else. They'd just squash them right down in there. See legs and hands sticking out that one place there. I was sitting up there and I looked over through and I thought, what's that shiny thing? So I crawled over there. Here it was a hand that was cut off and just laying there in the mud and it had a ring on his finger. I see stuff like that, you know, and then, oh, that's terrible. But you had to, you had to just forget about it and uh, think of keeping yourself alive, what you had to do. And as you can see, that I'm still alive. <laughs> and I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Oh. Ching, yeah. thank you for coming oh, thank and talking you. to you us. Bet. This has yeah. been fascinating. Well, I don't know if this is what you wanted, but... Uh, yes, it is. Oh, well, that's good. Yes, it is. Thanks a lot. Yeah. We'll end here, Dennis.
increase the cost to the bus at forty-five thousand, and I figured maintenance over the life of the vehicle at twenty-five thousand six hundred. Estimated total cost is two hundred thirty thousand six hundred divided by ten years is twenty-three thousand sixty dollars. That's how it came up. Just one informal quote made of one for $125,000, that's right? Yes. And that included, it included 10 students that were to be transported, or was it just the mileage that was, they were to ride the bus? The, uh, what it was, we wanted to compare apples and apples. Not apples and oranges. Uh, so therefore, number one, we started out as to what we would need Bid price obviously would have to be for that type of bus. If you're going to have some other kind of bus, or we could, that's right. We would with it with a cube face, forward facing. Okay, I with 16,000 miles. But I'm, yeah. I'm just so you're talking about 10 students that you were trying to transport, and this is the quote that you asked. Right. No, I'm or you were asking for these other and or for these kids also in that $145. type of vehicle on the mileage. So we told them we needed a vehicle that would handle four wheelchair students, uh, the same number of regular students, and would travel 16,000 miles a year. We didn't tell them how many tracks it was. Uh, and they well, I'm okay. Another question. The students, are they, ge uh, they generated from uh, permanent or, you know, so-called permanent families? Basically, uh, they are students, children of whatever. children in our school district yes. that live in our school district. Well, really, some of them live in their district. No, I, I, I realize that, but sometimes <coughs> these kids are moved. The, these types, they're more, uh, more transient than, than the ones that are living okay, in the district. Okay, this is what I was trying to address when I, when I be prefaced my remark that uh, they're going to be with us for a long time because they have. Yeah, they are they are there. Okay. One more comment, if I might make, uh, so that the public and the people here, the board, do not misunderstand that not every handicapped child is served with these buses. Uh, I happen to have a handicapped child, and I'll tell you, I've had uh, who has respiratory problems and some other problems. placed upon in the big bus always. I didn't feel that it was necessary to drive that small bus and go through that expense. And I've had complete cooperation instead of having her go to a, a location some distance away from the house, he uses our house as one of the stops for the kids to drive. And I really appreciate it. the same opportunity to bid. I appreciate that. I didn't realize there was an issue because no, no one contacted me. Or well, I'm just wondering about a future need to say that 10 is looking at this about or two schools are adequate for the next thing. Well, if we can't tell uh, Jerry, I could never say that. I sat back here three years in a row. Yeah. we see here now is what does give us some flexibility. I also believe that uh, in terms of the very constraints that are on us with this group of people, that it would behoove us, especially given, given the financial considerations, to have our own. I think there's a definite asset there as opposed to contracting to uh, If I won't reiterate, but I So it's, I'd like to see us look, I want to take this one step further. At some point, I think we need to look more globally at uh, where all of this is going and where all the regulations, where the, uh, how far is the public school district and the taxpayer going to keep going with this kind of thing? We don't have any choice now. This Board of Education
Christian can't do anything. Mary Jo, if I, if I might say, mentioned to me today, we talked about having a life partner here uh, in, a, in a Delta conference discussion, and she mentioned maybe that's a time to you know make them aware that this is an increasing difficulty for all of us. And is there anything that they can do? Is there any leeway, leeway? Can people try to endeavor, do something that What is the what is the um, is there hand aid from the Considered this Say in respect to this, and, what, and if this is this is what you need, and there's nothing wrong with it. And I understand it, Mary. The, the concern that was expressed to Don wasn't the way the bid was written. It was the time element that mm -hmm. gave them to respond. But I'm saying there's nothing wrong if, if, if this is what you need. If, if the question is, no, we if they don't want to make it, one of the things is we want to demonstrate because of the loneliness of saving cost wise, another thing is because of the new CDL regulations. Uh, So there's some reasons why we hold again on the It could also be very helpful in individuals and business or uh, for that matter in the community. 